Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our Wednesday uh, seminar. Uh, so today we have the pleasure of hosting uh, Dr. Chiro uh, Pinto. So let me say a few things about uh, our speaker. So first of all, uh, uh, well, Chiro did uh, his undergrad in, at the University of Naples. Uh, and please correct me if, if I get any of, of that uh, wrong. And then uh, he did his uh, also his master's in, in, uh, in Naples, and then he moved to a colder place called the Netherlands for uh, uh, his uh, PhD. So he did his PhD at uh, Nijmegen uh, uh, with uh, Professor Verbund. And then after that, he spent some time uh, at Cambridge as a research associate. Uh, then he moved to ESA. Uh, was that in the ne Netherlands as well? Yes. Okay. And then since uh, 2019, he's a staff uh, researcher at uh, INAF uh, back in Italy. Uh, so um, today he's going to talk about uh, uh, ULXs. And so, Tiro, thanks again for accepting our uh, invitation and uh, for doing this and your time. And uh, I will stop talking and the floor is yours. Thank you. Everything is correct. Precisely during my PhD, I uh, was at Ezron and Utrecht University, but then they shut down the astronomy department six months before my defense. And then I had to defend in Nijmegen because Frankfurt Bund moved to Nijmegen. This kind of weird things also happens, but it's fine. Yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, ULXs. Uh, don't be scared. We are basically talking of X-ray binaries, which go crazy. Um, these are a list of my uh, mo <clears throat> most frequent collaborators. Um, basically, the talk will be about convincing you why it's so much fun to go beyond the Eddington limit. I'll provide uh, a little context, especially regarding the problem of growing fast black holes, how super Eddington accretion can help. But I will focus mainly on stellar mass black holes and their feedback because of sake of time. But if you are interested in supermassive black holes and also future prospective missions, I have uh, several bonus slides, which might be also good for the, for the discussion. So I don't take too much time. So I assume uh, most of you are uh, familiar with stellar mass black hole and neutron stars. They are born from the explosions, beautiful explosions of stars called supernovae. And then we realized that in the center, the nucleus has become a compact object because uh, at, at, um, at some point they start to accrete from uh, nearby stars uh, through Roche lobe overflow. And since the system rotates due to conservation of angular momentum, matter doesn't go straight into uh, the compact objects, but it rather spiralizes, uh, forming what we call an accretion disk. Over there, uh, friction heats up the disk and uh, up to reaching actually really high temperature up to million degrees. And therefore this object uh, emitted virtually every uh, wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, sometimes speaking in the X-rays. Uh, uh, the X-ray spectra uh, have some sort of variation. Often they show themselves fairly thermal with the dominant black body component that comes from the disk, uh, on top of which you, we, always, we often see uh, a harder component that dominates above 2 kV and we model with uh, Comptonization. Uh, then we have supermassive black holes, which are completely different objects, much, much bigger. We go from the uh, a few tens of solar masses, stellar uh, black holes, to uh, billions uh, solar mass, supermassive black holes. They were um, originally discovered uh, through quasars or quasi-radio stellar objects. Uh, originally, they, they thought uh, they were stars in our galaxy, then they realized they were at the center of uh, external galaxies, so they had to be intrinsically very bright. Uh, and for some of them, in particular M87, uh, rotation curves of the stars around the center uh, was, able, uh, was possible to measure, and, and this um, uh, indicated that the mass in the very central part, parsec, had to be really high. Uh, with a very high density, something like 10 to the 7 solar mass in a single parsec. 
which is very difficult to, to make out of simple stars. In fact, actually, recently, the European Horizon Telescope uh, made this marvelous picture uh, through the technique of the interferometry, which uh, revealed the presence of a black hole and the black hole uh, shadow here in the dark uh, with the accretion of matter uh, around. They also were able to measure uh, accurately the mass to the order of six, 10 to the nine solar masses. Um, however, we already knew the presence of a supermassive black hole powering active galactic nuclei because it's very difficult to uh, explain this spectra uh, in, a, in a way that is different from accretion. Um, the soft band will be somehow dominated by uh, thermal um, uh, emission from the disk. Then just like in stellar mass black holes, you have a power law like um, emission in the hard band that uh, we, we think it's due to a coronal gas that is very hot and optically thin, closer to the black hole, uh, scattering the so soft seed of the disk. Uh, this is well established. The thing that is less established is the exact shape of the corona that we don't really know uh, how it is, if it's spherical, if it's slab, Although there is some recent work on uh, uh, polarimetry with the IXP that is suggesting possible shapes. And then uh, some of the photons of the corona, they go back to the accretion disk being reprocessed in what we normally call reflection and it gives rise to uh, fluorescence lines such as the iron line and reprocessed continuum such as the, the Compton amp that normally appears to around 20, 30 kV. This is normally what uh, an editon limit, limited object uh, would look like. Um, the problem is, how do we go from stellar mass to supermassive black holes? We are talking of several orders of uh, change in the mass of the compact object. Um, gravitational waves uh, discovery somehow helps because they, they uh, evidence that Mass, the first of all, there are massive black holes up to 100 solar masses, which perhaps they originate from uh, massive stars with very low metallicity. And then they emerge forming a larger uh, black hole. So certainly merging of black holes can help, but it's not very simple to merge uh, thousands of 10,000 of black holes because many of them would have a natural kick and thrown out of the system. So just merging black holes to go from 10 to a billion solar mass, it's not gonna be very easy. Certainly accretion can help. And accretion uh, can also have an effect on the surrounding medium. Um, in the plot that you see here on the left is a well-known relationship between the mass of the black hole in the y-axis and the mass of the bulge of the host galaxy that hosts the supermassive black hole. They are strongly correlated, suggesting that there is a there has to be some coeval evolution between the galaxy and the supermassive black hole. And you might wonder whether it's the black hole that is having an impact on the, on the galaxy rather than the other way around by comparing the accretion energy of the black hole with the binding energy of the galaxy. The accretion energy uh, that you can calculate as the accretion efficiency that is of the order of 10% conversion of matter into radiation times the black hole mass uh, and the speed of light square. This is very similar to, uh, N, uh, to the Einstein equation. You can compare it to the binding energy of the galaxy that is the mass of the galaxy times the velocity dispersion square. And it's extremely interesting to notice that the first, the one of the black hole is uh, an order of magnitude bigger. So throughout the course of its life, the black hole must have necessarily an impact on the uh, host galaxy. And uh, there is also evidence by comparison with the star formation rate, or basically the rate at which new stars are created in the host galaxies. Uh, you can see uh, at very high redshift when the universe was young, uh, at a few, let's say less than one giga year old, um, it, it takes time for the AGN uh, to start to accrete more and more and more, but then as soon as they catch up with the star formation rate uh, in the host galaxy, then both of them go down. 
And this could be an indication that as soon as the AGN uh, start to be uh, uh, highly accreting, then they somehow throw away a lot of material um, having an effect, an effect on the accretion on the AGN itself or, or the black hole, but also on the surrounding medium. And one of the biggest issues um, is the mass of the black hole and, and the high redshift. It's not a big problem to grow a black hole from 10 to a billion solar mass uh, in, the, in the entire life of the universe over the course of 13 billion years. The big problem is that many of them are discovered redshift above uh, seven when the universe was less than a giga year old. And this recent work done with JWST that is discovering this monster at, at even higher redshift like 10 or even 15 or 16. So it's, it's a big problem because depending where we find these uh, massive black holes, uh, we would require a different um, uh, starting mass. For example, if we find a supermassive black hole of 10 to the nine solar masses at redshift seven, and there are plenty now, uh, you understand that accreting uh, up to the Eddington limit, you would require a starting mass of the order of 10 to the four solar mass, which is an intermediate mass black hole. Uh, if we find AGN at even higher redshift, then this means that the uh, initial mass should be even higher. Unless of course, uh, uh, accretion occurs beyond the Eddington limit. And then you can start with uh, a typical a uh, high mass black hole from uh, a pop three star, population three star, accreting at the Eddington limit, above the Eddington limit, the curve will be somehow steeper. And then we would be able to catch up with these massive black holes discovered uh, at redshift above seven. Uh, the problem is that it's not very simple to accrete beyond the Eddington limit, especially in a spherical regime. If you accrete spherically, uh, every particle around the central object would be subjected to a gravitational force, but also to a radiation force. And this second is really important because it goes in the opposite direction with respect to the compact object. So you understand that if you uh, put equilibrium between these two forces, you can work out a maximum luminosity, which is just dependent on the mass of the compact object. Uh, an object like the sun would have a maxim maximum luminosity of the order of 10 to the 38 terps per second. A black hole, standard black hole of 10 solar masses would have a maximum luminosity uh, of 10 to 39 terps per second, if accretion is of course spherical. And this can uh, be interpreted also uh, as a maximum accretion rate or a maximum growth rate, M dot, uh, what depends on the luminosity uh, divided by the accretion efficiency and speed of light, which for a standard uh, 10 solar mass black hole would be of the order of 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year. So in principle, spherically accretion, uh, spherical accretion shouldn't go beyond this. For disk, it's a little bit easier, but even in accretion disks, it's not very simple uh, if the disk remains thin to accrete beyond these limits. However, uh, there are objects that shine well beyond the Eddington limit for the, their masses. Um, supermassive black holes as well, uh, particularly during tidal disruption events, which are moment, uh, moments in which a star gets too close to uh, a 10 to the, say, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 uh, solar mass uh, black hole. The, the star gets ripped out, destroyed if it gets too close. And then um, half of the matter uh, gets onto the black hole. Uh, during this process, the accretion rate can be really high. And in fact, some of the tidal disruption events are brighter than the Eddington limit for a uh, supermassive black hole. And there are also some narrow line Seifert one, uh, such as 1H 707 or IRAS 13224, uh, whose bolometric luminosity often uh, is beyond the Ed their Eddington limit. Uh, the problem of studying in detail is this, these objects is that their uh, spectra uh, peak in the ultraviolet, which is highly dimmed by the interstellar absorption in our galaxy. So it's much easier to study super Eddington accretion 
in ultraluminous X-ray sources that are X-ray binaries um, at, uh, at high luminosity, uh, and their spectra peak in the X-ray, where the uh, interstellar absorption is much easier. Because of this, uh, this talk will focus on ultraluminous X-ray sources. And for those of you who are not familiar with the name um, and the field, this is a, a kind of recent field of view. They were discovered in the 50 years ago with Einstein telescope, but only since the launch of XMM Newton and Chandra about 20 years ago, the field really exploded and you can see uh, way more publication and works and also interesting discoveries, I would say, in the last five, six years. For those of you who are not very familiar, ULXs are uh, basically X-ray sources, uh, which empirically um, just surpass the Eddington limit for a standard 10 solar mass black hole. In other words, X-ray sources that are brighter than 10 to the 39 X per second in the X-ray band alone, and they are off nuclear, so not to be confused with the supermassive black hole in the, in the galaxy. Um, early work uh, showed that they are um, much more abundant in low metallicity, uh, high star forming galaxy, and they tend to be associated also with star forming region, suggesting that they have to be uh, very, very young sources. And there is a lot of work done also by Crete. Uh, department uh, on, on this uh, in this research field, um, discovering that about one two ULXs on average uh, per galaxies are found, and they are indeed associated with uh, young regions. Anyway, the, the, the this uh, reference that you see here are those that have focused a lot in building uh, uh, large catalogs of ULXs. So in the beginning, we, we thought we found the Holy Grail, uh, because if you have a, a source that shines just in between a stellar and a supermassive black hole, then you would think probably it's, it's just an intermediate mass black hole, right? Just uh, uh, with an intermediate mass between the stellar and supermassive regime, uh, particularly because there are a few objects, a few ULXs that behave uh, according to theoretical predictions. An example is the high perluminous X-ray source in the galaxy ESO 243, which behaves very similar to a galactic uh, stellar mass black hole, except scaled in luminosity and therefore in mass. This object uh, goes between periods of quiescence and outburst every couple of years, just like X-ray binary Eddington limit in our galaxy behave, switching between uh, uh, fainter, low hard and brighter high soft uh, spectra, the latter dominated by a thermal component below 1 kV. Um, except for the fact that in the last years, this source is not um, uh, shining anymore, suggests that probably it was a, a failed tidal disruption event. In other words, there is a massive black hole accreting from a, a companion star on a highly elliptical orbit. And then when it gets close to, to the black hole, uh, material is ripped off, uh, producing the, the outbursts. The, the, uh, the outburst is not happening anymore. So it's probably a failed tidal disruption event. And if you uh, estimate the mass from the luminosity, you would uh, get something like 10 to the five solar masses which is in the intermediate black hole regime, but you understand that it's at the low end of the supermassive black holes. So not, it's probably not uh, as extreme as we would like. You know, we would like to find something of the order of 10 to the three or so solar masses, 10 to the four. But unfortunately, there is no dynamical measurement of, of a mass uh, uh, through the use of the rotation curves and Kepler laws uh, for this kind of masses. Anyway, you under, and this source is also found associated with a cluster of stars, but you understand that if you want a massive black hole, you probably are looking for an old object and the best place to look are globular clusters, but most of your lexes are found near uh, star forming regions. So it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really help. Besides your lexes are uh, fairly different spectra wise from the galactic uh, uh, sub-Eddington system. In the plot that you have on the right here in yellow, 
uh, there, are, there is a solid and a dotted line indicating a typical hard and soft state of binaries in our galaxy. Uh, and you can see that the spectra of ULXs, they are orders of magnitude brighter, but also significantly softer. So this means that probably the accretion regime is significantly different, especially uh, because some of these objects switch between different states or actually I would say different regime because they are always so soft, but some of them are harder and then they become softer. And the one that you see here on the left is a collection of spectra from different ULXs and you can see how they switch between different regimes. It's a bit more complicated than uh, galactic uh, standard X-ray binaries. And also the spectral shape uh, complicates even further the picture because differently from X-ray binaries where you need two dominant spectral uh, component, the, uh, the disc and the corona, in ULXs, uh, you, you end up in needing three components. And you can see this every time you put XMM Newton and mu star together, uh, on, you, you have a, a cool component with temperature below a KV, which could be from the outer disc, and then a component around of a few kV, uh, which is most likely from the inner disk. But then there's also a hard tail, which dominates above 10 kV. And you see this all the time you observe a hard ULX with new star and you have enough statistics. So this could be either a corona in the innermost region or uh, uh, an accretion column on top of a neutron star, if the neutron star if, is the compact object. But, um, Another thing you can do is to try to understand how the luminosity of each spectral components evolve with the temperature, because you would expect for a standard Shakura Sunai of thin disk, the, uh, the luminosity to increase with the fourth power of the temperature. But this is not the case in your Alexis. You can see the soft component uh, in this source is basically flat in luminosity of, of different temperatures. And the hot component, which is this green, uh, green one over here, uh, is completely inconsistent. It's also weird the behavior. It first increase in temperature, then it drops down and increasing again, which means that something weird is going on. And there is work done by uh, two PhD students in Palermo, Francesco Barra and Alessandra Robba, of our group in other sources. In NGC 1313X2, Alessandra noted that uh, in the soft component is most likely anti-correlated, uh, the luminosity and the temperature, uh, something similar, but uh, something different, but still interesting has been seen in NGC 55 ULX, where we can find a significant uh, deviation above uh, two, two times 10 to the 39 ergs per second, bolometric luminosity. Uh, this, if, uh, this is really interesting because you can see that at the same luminosity, the temperature of the component is, uh, is lower. Uh, or in other words, uh, it seems like the disk is expanding. If this is due to the fact that you are surpassing the Eddington limit and launching a wind, then it means that this, uh, this threshold is the Eddington limit and you can work out the, the mass of the compact object to be 10 solar masses. In other words, a black hole. Of course, this is only one object. We would like to apply this to more sources, but this could be an, interest, an interesting way to figure out what is the compact object? But surprise, surprise, after many years that everybody thought that we were talking of black holes, pulsations have been found in many ULXs in the shape of very narrow peak in the power density spectra of um, high signals to noise data. And something like 20% of the data with good quality shows pulsations which means that the fraction of ULX is powered by neutron star has to be really high. Uh, and this is really exciting, particularly if you think that they can reach luminosity of 10 to the 41 X per second, that for a neutron star is 500 times the Eddington limit. It's true that magnetic fields can help, but you need also this material to, to reach such luminosity. Um, there is, some uh, spectral features that is fairly broad and has been associated with the cyclotron resonance scattering features. Uh, it's only in a few ULXs. They are not consistent with atomic transitions and they could be useful for 
uh, measuring the magnetic fields of the spinning neutron star. The problem is that this is a difficult task because depending on whether you associate it with an electron or a proton uh, uh, cyclotron scattering feature, you understand that the magnetic fields that you work out is very different. You can go from uh, a magnetar like 10 to the 15 Gauss down to uh, 10 to the 12 Gauss. So it's, it's a tough job to use these things. Um, if you put together the, the six uh, standard ULXs to the six uh, transient sources, there are other six sources that uh, for, for a very short amount of time, they uh, surpass the, uh, the, the 10 to the 39 ergs per second threshold, you end up in having a, a sample of 12 objects. I'm not going to speak that much about this table. I just want you to focus on the spin-up rate, uh, which tells you uh, how fast is the uh, spin period uh, getting shorter and shorter? And these two, some of you may seem to very uh, to be small man numbers, but they are actually very big, especially if you uh, somehow integrate over the course of time. Spin up rate like this uh, in normally would require very high accretion, and uh, it's among the most extreme for neutral stars in our galaxy. So this also is an evidence for a high accretion rate. And where do we get the material from? So ideally, you would like to perform optical spectroscopy in order to search for the companion star. And there has been a, a huge amount of work by uh, Marianne Haida and Peter Jonker and colleagues uh, searching for the counterparts uh, in many ULXs uh, with optical spectroscopy. They found evidence for uh, absorption bands that could be well modeled with spectra of uh, red uh, supergiant or blue supergiant stars. So in many of these sources, there is a huge star which can provide a lot of material with roche rob overfill. Of course, how do you do that? Uh, theoretical simulation from uh, Viktorowicz and Mondal and in general fr from the group of Berczynski in Poland uh, have shown that you can definitely do that. For example, by taking two standard main sequence stars of about eight and one solar masses separated by a uh, thousand uh, solar radii after dozens of uh, mega years, um, the big star will go through an AGB uh, uh, phase and then a common envelope. Part of the uh, envelope will be shared with the other main sequence star. Then the stars will die forming a white dwarf which can be uh, transformed in, in the neutron star um, by accretion, and then you would have a neutron star ULX system. There are many channels to form this kind of systems, also black holes, and I suggest you to look at these papers. The takeaway message is that the amount of material transferred onto a compact object can be really huge. Uh, this is the M dot over the course of time. The dashed line is the Eddington limit, and you can see that the, adding, the accretion rate can be 100 times the Eddington limit uh, for a neutron star. Uh, and also for a large amount of time, even for something like 100,000 of years. So astronomically speaking, these are young objects. 100,000 years is, is a short amount of time. But if you integrate the power uh, in terms of kinetic or, luminos or radiative luminosity of these objects, over this um, um, amount of time, you understand that these objects can be very powerful for the surrounding medium. And in fact, actually later on, I will show you how. So what happens when we take all this amount of matter and we throw it onto the compact object? What will happen is that radiation pressure start to be significantly important. The matter will be converted into radiation, which will puff the disk. The disk will swollen, won't be thin anymore. And in the upper side of the disk, radiation push will be stronger than gravitation, thereby throwing a powerful wind. So a uh, wind would be a nature prediction for super Eddington systems, and in particular for ULXs. Uh, the important thing is that the wind will give the system the shape of, of a funnel, and then you will all understand that the, the appearance of this system significantly depend on our inclination angle. And schematically speaking, this is what we would expect. The thick disk, the wind, and the compact object, 
If we see phase on from low inclination, our line of sight can access the uh, inner region and the source will appear very hard. Uh, but then as soon as the inclination angle increase, the wind will start to decrease to absorb, to block the light from the inner region and the source will become progressively softer, going basically from a hard to a soft ultra luminous X-ray source. Of course, if the compact object is not a black core or an unmagnetized neutron star, but rather a magnetized neutron star, the things can be significantly different. In the most extreme case, you have a magnetar. Uh, what can happen is that the uh, magnet magnetospheric radius can be really, really large, basically surpassing the spherization radius, which is the radius where uh, the, the wind is normally launched. If this is happens, then the geometry is completely different because the magnetic fields will channel all the accretion, uh, diffreted matter on top of the neutron star. And, and basically you would launch no wind, okay? And magnetic fields normally help to accrete material because they significantly suppress the Thomson cross-section. So you would, um, you would see very strong luminosity in this case and no wind at all. If you have an intermediate case, uh, something like uh, 10 to the 12 Gauss or below, uh, which would be fairly high, but still kind of galactic uh, magnetic field of a neutron star, then the magnetospheric radius would be uh, smaller than the spherization radius, provided that the accretion rate is above 10, 20 times the Eddington limit for a neutron star. And then you can have both an accretion column uh, on top of the polar cups and the spherization radius, which is where the disk puffed up and launched the winds. So you understand that the, this, whether, if we find or not find winds, at all in ULXs would be a strong indication for the strength of the, of the, of the magnetic field. Because if we find strong winds, the, wind, the magnetic field has to be somehow limited. If, the, if the, the winds are weak or completely absent, then we would imagine having a magnetar. Okay. So just that remember that the accretion rates in these objects are really high. So even if you have a, a strong magnetic field, it's very difficult to keep it for a long time due to the accretion of matter. Uh, of course, here I'm talking of dipolar fields, but magnetic fields can be a little bit more complicated. So how do we search for winds? The best way to do that uh, is to search for Doppler shifted spectral features. For example, looking at the left plot, um, the green area here is the typical shape of a, a, a line uh, created by scattering of photons into the wind. And then the, if there is material going in our direction in the line of sight, this will absorb uh, the material from the inner region, creating an absorption feature that is shifted towards the blue uh, um, by an amount that depends on the velocity of the wind. And we can definitely do this uh, with the current detectors. Uh, what we would like to do, but at the moment is difficult, uh, is to check the shape of the line because differentiating between uh, a Gaussian-like and a skewed, especially skewed towards the blue wing, uh, line profile would be a strong way to, a strong indication of either thermal or radiation-driven or magnetical drive uh, wind. So this would be great. At the moment, this is almost impossible, but with future uh, instruments, this is definitely possible. And I have some bonus slides if you are curious, but we can definitely search for winds and see also how they respond to the continuum, which helps to understand their nature. Currently, the best detector to search for wind are the uh, reflection, sorry, in ULXs, uh, the reflection grating spectrometers uh, aboard XMM Newton or RGS. Uh, because they have a good uh, combination of effective area uh, and spectral resolution. Uh, for those of you who are not very familiar, uh, on XMM Newton, uh, the two telescopes that throw light onto the MOS 1 and 2, they are also equipped with two uh, grating arrays that reflected something like 40% of the light onto a, uh, a camera 
which is the RGS camera. So you have uh, this dispersed spectra with a very high spectral resolution, an order of magnitude or two better than the standard uh, CCD spectrum. And this is what we use. You need to take a lot of exposure time because we are talking of X-ray binaries that are found in other galaxy mainly. So several, a few or several megaparsec away. But then if you do that, then you can make discovery. And the first thing we saw were emission lines consistent with the laboratory wavelengths on the most common transition in the soft X-ray band. Uh, on top of which there was also absorption, but the absorption lines were not consistent with the uh, atomic feature requiring some shift, just as I mentioned before. Zooming on the 1 kV area or 12 angstrom, um, you can see better the, uh, the, the absorption in this source. And this was a kind of double luck source because looking better with the CCD of XMM plus new star, uh, we, we found evidence for an absorption uh, from iron cave which shifted in the, in the hard X-ray band. But this is very difficult with the current CCD spectra. So uh, how do we search for lines? Certainly we can't just use the eye. So one way to do is to scan the spectra with a moving Gaussian, with a one Gaussian basically to detect all lines. Um, and then you calculate, of course, the spectral improvement with respect to a simple continuum uh, model. And then you calculate the single trial significance by um, uh, either taking the ratio between the normalization and the error of the, the normalization of the Gaussian, or even better, you calculate the square root um, of the, um, the chi-square improvement and if you multiply by the sign of the normalization, you can distinguish between uh, uh, emission and uh, absorption lines. Um, and then in this way, you can see many of the emission lines consistent with rest frame laboratory wavelengths, while the blue, the absorption, they require uh, significant blue shift. If you want to know how we estimate the actual significance with Monte Carlo simulations, uh, we have uh, some additional slides. So a former PhD student uh, of mine in um, Cambridge, Peter Cosets, now working at MIT with Erin Cara, uh, did this for uh, a catalog of ULXs with uh, ideal uh, number of counts in RGS spectra, which is something above a thousand counts, something like this. And he indeed found that in the vast majority of the sources there are indeed emission lines and uh, uh, rest frame uh, laboratories. Um, absorption are uh, found with the slightly lower uh, occurrence and they seems to require uh, some sort of shift because uh, they are uh, inconsistent in most cases with uh, the most dominant laboratories. So we find more often uh, emission lines. This is important for the geometry. The other thing, and perhaps the most interesting result uh, in this uh, catalog sample study is that the, uh, uh, the ULXs with the soft spectrum, they tend to have uh, a large number of lines, of uh, highly significant lines. And this is really important because it's exactly what you would expect from the uh, this kind of uh, kind of funnel shaped geometry, because at high inclination, uh, as we see uh, right now here, the object, uh, we will basically see through the wind. So the wind will decrease the continuum, which kind of helps to detect the emission line, but you will also see the absorption line through the wind. And that's why we see a lot of lines in soft spectra. But then as soon as the inclination angle decrease and we see uh, close to face on, uh, the continuum will be much higher, uh, kind of washing away the emission lines, but also the absorption line will decrease because we will see the hotter phase of the wind, which is more ionized. So you will have less lines. So this is a model independent way to uh, determine the geometry of the system. And what kind of lines we would expect from these winds? Uh, the, the source in the center is really bright. We have a huge radiation field. So you would expect the wind to be 
uh, dominated by photoionization. In other words, a photon that is absorbed by the, the, the plasma of the wind, which is then photo ionized, uh, led by photoionization equilibrium. We normally parameterize this with the ionization parameter, uh, which is the, the luminosity of the source divided by the number of particles, or in other ways, the density of photoionizing photons per uh, of the gas. And this is a very good proxy of the temperature. Basically, the higher the ionization parameter, the higher the temperature. And if you apply some photoionization codes, you can predict the column density of the individual ions at different um, ionization parameters. And you can see that we are, as we expect to be dominated by uh, oxygen seven and eight, neon nine and 10 species. And then there is uh, a little of uh, uh, nitrogen seven and a lot of iron, but iron is split in many ions. And because of this, the dominant line would be nitrogen, and, uh, sorry, uh, neon and oxygen. So what we do is we scan the spectra with grids of uh, plasma calculated in a broad uh, parameter space of ionization parameter, column density of the wind, velocity, and so on. We create grids for different velocity and ionization parameter. We fit the spectrum for each of them and see how uh, it improves the spectral continuum. And then we, uh, we record whether, where there is the peak in the chi-square or C-statistic um, uh, space. And doing this, Peter found uh, strong evidence for a 25% speed of light wind blowing from a pulsating ULX, which is an important result as it indicated that uh, this magnetized neutron star is launching the wind, so the magnetic field can be too high. Perhaps a better way to visualize this is by making contour plots, um, in particular uh, ionization parameter versus velocity, and the color is the improvement of the spectral fit, and in this way you can visualize better your this result. This is uh, the, the, the detection of a 17% speed of light wind in a soft ULX. Looking at the CCD spectra, we realized that the, the wind also somehow changes over the time. You can see this absorption line about one kV decreasing uh, over the course of time. And for some sources, uh, we, we got a huge amount of data with XMM and we could perform uh, wind variation studies, in particular, uh, the, the response of the wind to the continuum. And what we see is that when the source becomes brighter and softer, uh, there is an additional component of the wind that is cooler and softer. And sorry, I, what I meant is uh, slower, which will basically suggest that the accretion rate is increasing, the source is getting brighter, and you start to throw away material from the outer side um, of, the, of the disk, beyond basically the spherization radius. Uh, if you want to know how we do this also in supermassive black holes, uh, we have uh, some bonus slides, some work done by uh, uh, our group, but I will go on. The emission lines also vary over time, and this is really important because it's a, a confirmation that they are not due to the star forming region or the host galaxy, but they are indeed due to the ULX itself. And we don't know yet exactly where they come from because they are uh, at the rest frame and they are fairly narrow of about a thousand kilometers per second. So there is a good possibility that these are from a thermal wind in the outer side of the disk. But uh, this is really brand new stuff and we're still working on it. So uh, I'm almost finished. Um, in order to confirm the, the geometry, what we did is to uh, compare the velocity and the ionization parameter of the wind with the spectral shape of the source or the spectral hardness. And we found that the, both the velocity and the ionization parameter of the wind seem to increase with the hardness uh, ratio, uh, which is basically how steep is the spectrum of the source. Of course, we would like to populate this diagram with more sources for which we will need uh, more data, and we are actually working on it right now. Uh, 
the thing that the wind is faster and hotter is in, in harder sources is in agreement with the uh, fact that we are seeing face on through the funnel where we can see the, the hot regions of the disk and the wind coming from the inner region in absorption. So faster because the escape velocity is high here and also more ionized. And then when the inclination increase, the wind is absorbing the inner region. So we are looking in this area where the hardness ratio is lower. The wind is also coming from outside, which means it has to be cooler and slower. And in fact, actually it seems to be cooler and slower than, uh, than this region over here. So it, the, the situation is, the, the, the results are kind of consistent. And this is my last slide before the conclusion. Um, as I mentioned you before, if you have a, a huge source of radiation and energy, this can have an impact on the surrounding medium. This happens not only for supermassive black hole and supernova, but also for ULXs. In fact, many of them are surrounded by huge interstellar cavities that we call bubbles. They are very big uh, of, a row of about 100 parsec or larger and they expand with velocities up to 100 kilometers per second, which is supersonic in the interstellar medium. Uh, if you calculate the kinetic power that you need to inflate them, uh, you would require something like um, 10 to the 39 Earth per second or above. And you can search or figure out whether this is due to the wind of the ULX by calculating the kinetic power of the wind, which is alpha, uh, m dot square times uh, velocity square of the wind. If you substitute the definition of the outflow rate, uh, you understand that the, the kinetic power of the wind strongly depends on the velocity square. And don't forget that these winds blow at 20% speed of the light. So this is a really huge number. Even if you multiply by uh, the clumpiness or the porosity of the wind and the solid angle, which are likely of the order of 10 to 30%. If you calculate the, the value and you substitute what we measure for the wind parameter, uh, unicision parameter and velocity, we, we get a kinetic power of 10 to the 39 Hertz per second or above, which says two important things. The first is that the, the winds are uh, energetic enough to inflate the bubbles. And second, that you need something like 50% of the budget in order to inflate of the wind or something like that. Because uh, the radiation luminosity is, the radiative luminosity is, is basically comparable to this number. So you lose a lot into the wind, but not everything. Half of it certainly is being accreted. And this means that you can grow the compact object, perhaps with the aid of advection, uh, with a very high accretion rate. So this is a lot of information. And there is some recent work suggesting that these winds and jets can create a synchrotron emission uh, and perhaps also giving uh, origin to fast radio bursts. Um, th th this is some paper that has been published recently. This is probably new stuff that is absolutely worth to be investigated, the origin of fast radio bursts. So takeaway message. I hope I convinced you that ULX are the ideal laboratories to uh, study extreme accretion rates in black holes and in particular um, to understand how you can grow uh, fast uh, compact objects and to understand their effect on the surrounding medium. We have learned really a lot thanks to re uh, recent uh, instrumentation and in particular XM and Newton. We have learned a lot about their phenomenology. There's a lot of uh, unanswered questions and I can show you uh, if you have questions during the discussion with bonus slides how future mission will help and if you're curious I can tell you how we use these techniques to study supermassive black holes but for the moment I thank you very much uh, for your attention thanks uh, so thank you very much uh, uh, thanks you for this uh, very nice uh, um, Exciting overview. Are there, uh, so, are there any questions for our speaker? Uh, I see Andreas has uh, his hand raised. Yes. So, um, 
Uh, uh, Andrea, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, uh, that was a very nice uh, uh, overview. Uh, uh, so I have a question. I actually have two questions. One question is, you alluded to a connection between wind launching and uh, the state, the accretion state, or actually the specular state of a ULX. Uh, can you elaborate a bit more on that? I mean, do, do we really see a correlation between ULX being in the hard or soft state and whether they launch winds or not? So, okay, let me just clarify. Uh, when a ULX is a ULX, which means that it's, um, because sometimes in a few cases, they go beyond 10 to the 39, but, when, but many of them are persistently above. So when they are above 10 to the 39, we cannot speak of a soft and uh, hard state. It's uh, always a soft state with respect to the galactic X-ray binaries, uh, just as I mentioned in the very beginning. Uh, but, so it's basically the ULX state. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was, I was, I was wondering about the states within the ULX state. <laughs> yes, so the, the regimes, yeah. So exactly. we have a hard and uh, soft regimes. Um, when the regime changes, then the, the wind also responds. And I had this slide here. In other words, uh, there is a very strong component that is cooler and softer in the wind when the, the ULX become softer, but, but in some cases brighter. So this means that if the accretion rate increase, uh, perhaps I have a, 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 a very simplified picture here. Um, I thought I had it, I don't have, oh, this one. So if the M dot increase, uh, the, the area that is launching the wind is broader, and then you start to see absorption also from the outer part of the wind, of the, the, of the wind, of the spherization radius, where the wind is cooler and softer and uh, slower. Because of this, you would imagine, you would expect to see a, a slight change in the wind when the accretion rate, local accretion rate increase. I hope this answers your question. Okay, yes, exactly, exactly. Okay, and, and the second question is, uh, based on that and that the, the connection that you made between the strength of the magnetic field and the, and, and the M dot, would you expect to see a correlation between the detection rate of accreting pulsars and the presence of a wind or not? Uh, let, let me explain. Um, what, what I'm thinking is that if you have a strong absorption feature, and especially a cool absorption feature, means that you are looking at the wind almost like from, the, from a very, very uh, wide angle, which could mean that you have higher absorption, which could mean that you may not be able to see the pulsations. Yes. So would you expect a correlation like that? And uh, does this make sense? And uh, have you seen any trends in that direction? Okay, uh, we, um, we found pulsations only in uh, hard ULXs, okay. which, are, which are face on. Uh, we don't uh, find uh, pulsations in the soft ULXs, and uh, th th this could be due to A, the thing you told me, that we are looking through the wind so we cannot see pulsation. The second reason uh, could also be that uh, in, in many of them with winds, the magnetic field is significantly lower, or indeed some of them are black holes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have stronger winds. So we, uh, I, I'm afraid at the moment we have a very low um, sample because we have winds in a, it basically with absorption in a dozen sources and about 20 sources with lines and with pulsations is only in 12 objects of which six are transient ULXs. So at the moment we, we really miss uh, the sample for doing these kind of things. And that's why uh, I, was, I basically mentioned uh, the, the fact that we need future missions such as for example, CRISM that will increase the, um, the wind detection, uh, especially in the hot phase, uh, which is expected when we see phase on. And then there will be also missions that helps a lot to search for pulsations. So for this, I'm a, for, you know, make, make a constraint, we need future mission. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chiro. You're welcome, Andreas.
All right, so I see a hand raised by Nick. Yes, please. Kilavis. Nick, are you still there? Yes, yeah. I'm still here, but the, my phone rang, so I had to mute myself. Um, thank you, Sarah, for a very nice talk and a very good review of you, Alexis. Um, uh, since I do not work uh, on you, Alexis, I, I'm not very familiar with all the theoretical work that has been done. Um, is there a prediction for the polarization expected, if any, from you, Alexis? Because now with ICSPE, we could uh, uh, see if that prediction is uh, confirmed and whether it tells us something. Okay, this is a very good question. Uh, uh, before going into the geometric detail, I will say that uh, with ICSPE, we can do this only if a ULX uh, pop-ups in the Magellanic cloud or closer, which by the way happens because for example, a couple of years ago, there was a neutron star uh, which became a ULX uh, for a moment in the, in the Magellanic cloud and it was extremely bright. It saturated most of the detectors, saturated Chandra, RGS, basically everything. Uh, for that thing, you can do it with the uh, IXP, but you need it uh, uh, to turn on nearby. At the moment, we can't do it, but we can definitely do it with EXTP which is supposed to launch uh, in the late twenties, if everything goes okay. Uh, but I guess you probably have heard of EXTP. It's basically yeah. a bigger uh, XPEM to be launched in uh, six years from now, something like this. Now, regarding the prediction, uh, if you, you, you can imagine that the, depending on the magnetic field, you will have a completely different polarization if you have a strong magnetic field, you may have a high degree of polarization. Uh, if the magnetic field is, is low, then the, the, you still have a, a funnel geometry, uh, but the, the dominant component in the X-ray band for a face on object is in the hard band. So it really depends because if it's a black hole, then you, you may have a slab structure, which has probably, which is going to be a polarization different with respect to uh, an accretion column. Regarding the degree, I, I honestly don't know, but I certainly expect degrees lower than the binaries in our galaxy, unless indeed you have a very strong accretion column a la Hercules X1. So in this case, you would expect, for example, the hard component to have a similar polarization to Hercules X1, I guess. It's just a guess. Mm -hmm. So certainly uh, polarization will help to distinguish between geometries and compact objects. Right, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Nick. Um, uh, uh, sir, thank you, uh, Tio. I, so... I have a quick question. Uh, just to understand, right right now, do we have uh, observations of your legs with IXP and uh, some recent results about the geometry? No, I don't think they planned because uh, oh. ULX are distant. Um, you would need to observe for several megaseconds, but probably even more than maybe 10 megaseconds in order to just search for a polarized, mm -hmm. polarized signal, but it's very difficult. And that's yeah, why- because, Yeah, because it, I was wondering if uh, we had the results from this uh, methodology with polarization. If we could uh, compare these results with the word of Kosek, where he did the, that you told later, the, this uh, plot that you showed with the number of lines. Yes. A, uh, yes. And you said that is a model independent uh, method in order to constrain the geometry. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, yeah. I'm pretty certain they have not planned any observation yet of you, Alexis, because uh, for polarization, you need a really a lot of photons. And even for, for example, supermassive black holes who are bright, but they are even more distant, uh, they observe for a megasecond in order to get something. So that's why they haven't planned yet ULXs. But I guess if something like this turn out uh, to, to burst in, in our galaxy or in the Magellanic cloud, Ah, that would be absolutely doable. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, so thank you very much. I think we ran out of time. It was uh, also a very interesting Q&A. Uh, so thanks again to our speaker. Zero, thanks again for doing this. Uh, hopefully we can repeat this uh, in person next time. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much, Zero. Very nice. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. So bye everyone and see you next time. Thank you everybody. Bye. Yes, us. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Bye.